Hello, and welcome to the American Compass podcast. My name is Oren Cass. I'm chief economist at American Compass, and it is a big week with the Republican National Convention going on. Senator J.D. Vance now on the Donald Trump ticket and a lot going on in American Compass world. Today's podcast is is a wonderful conversation with Henry Olson. He's a brilliant political analyst, been following trends in the Republican Party closely for decades, and in particular was one of the first to focus on the obvious trend toward a working class conservatism. In fact, his book on Ronald Reagan, The Blue Collar Conservative, makes an an extraordinarily persuasive case that Reagan himself was focused on the working class. And it was really a perversion of Reaganism that brought the party to its far less successful market fundamentalism in the 90s and 2000s. So that is, is a really wonderful conversation looking all the way back to Reagan, understanding where the Republican Party went back on off the rails, how it has gotten back on the rails, and what the meaning of the Vance nomination is. So hope you'll really enjoy that. You should also be sure to follow Henry on Twitter, Henry Olson EPPC. Generally great commentary, but especially when there is an important election anywhere in the world, he is he is the one to follow to make sense of the returns. Before we get to Henry, I also just wanted to mention some other things we've got going on. On the commons, Batya Unger Sargon had a terrific reaction to the VP pick on Monday evening. Patrick Brown has a piece out on the silver linings of the economy for the working class today, as there certainly are some things that are going well. Compass Point is from me adapting my remarks last week at the National Conservatism Conference on the need to not only beat back the old guard on the right, but then also develop a positive governing vision. The title of that is What Time Is It? Time to Govern. And if you have not already, I don't know what you're waiting for, but please do subscribe to the new Substack that I am publishing commentary on Mondays, links on Fridays. That is Understanding America. Find it at understandingamerica.substack.com. And with that, here is Henry Olson. Henry Olson, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me on, Oren. Henry is perhaps my one of my favorite political analysts, certainly the one who has taught me most about the the history of the Republican Party and and the the misunderstood history of the Republican Party. And as as we are perhaps entering a new epoch, seemed like a a perfect time to to discuss where we've been. What, what what is the Kamala Harris line? Uh, imagine where we can go unburdened by by where we have been, and so on. So, mm-hmm. uh, but let's let's start a little further back. I think your you know your work on Ronald Reagan as as the the working class Republican is is incredibly important and uh, sort of not appreciated in in what well, your work is appreciated. But Ronald Reagan's status as as the working class Republican has has been lost in in the gloss that was put on it. Um, how would you characterize real Reaganism, not not what not what it is now thought of as? Yeah. The real Reagan was somebody who was concerned first and foremost with the dignity of the individual. He thought that it was intimately connected to liberty, but that liberty could be constrained to protect dignity. And what that meant was that. He was at a time when the conservative movement remained staunchly libertarian, supportive of entitlement programs, supportive of new programs that would preserve the dignity of the individual, supportive of compulsory unionism. He eventually came around to -to right-to-work laws, but he remained strongly supportive of unions. And in his autobiography, written after his presidency, He talked about the thing that upset him most in his life was somebody taking away someone's democratic rights, whether it's a employer or the government. And I don't think that there's anybody in the conservative movement uh, who claims to be a Reaganite who would stand up and say, you know, your employer can take away your democratic rights. (laughs) Because literally that's not true if you conceive of democratic rights in a narrow political sense. But that was never Reagan's conception. And so consequently, he offered a beautiful vision of the possibilities of human life while also supporting government intervention to preserve the dignity and the self-sufficiency of the individual. Yeah, one of my favorite anecdotes, I, I just dropped it into a, an essay we just published at American Compass, is is looking at his famous line, you know, the nine the nine most terrifying words in the English language, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. 
Turns out he delivered that at, at a press conference uh, announcing unprecedented support for farmers through <laughs> through new price supports and export programs and, and everything else. Uh, he he obviously had a much more nuanced understanding of of, of the inherent tensions than uh, than has been characterized. When did that change? I mean, if someone you know in in 1989, as people were writing their their tributes to the end of his presidency. Were, were they already trying to recast him as as the libertarian in chief, or did, did that come later? Yeah, you know, I think there was always a dichotomy. There were people who were the libertarians in chief who supported him and glommed on to him. And certainly in the context of the 60s and 70s and 80s, where there was a push for much more government than there even is from Joe Biden today, uh, that they could see that and they chose not to see the other things. And when they could see, be forced to see them, they would say, well, that's just a political calculation. In his heart, Ronald Reagan was with us. He would have if he could have. And my argument is there's absolutely no proof of that. Zero proof of that, that he is incredibly consistent in his public writings, in his private letters, that he was never somebody who thought that government should be small enough to drown in a bathtub. And so I think that there is part willful mischaracterization and part just an unwillingness to come to grips with what the real Reaganism meant for an individual. That Ronald Reagan wrote in 1964, human nature avoids change and it bends over backwards to uh, avoid radical change. And I think that's true of all these libertarians, is that if the man who brought them to the promised land, relevance, really didn't agree with them, they would have to embrace radical change, and they simply have been unable to do it. Yeah, the, the drown in the bathtub line reminds me also of the, the starve the beast model. And one thing I've found striking, we've been doing a lot of work on, on tax and budget policy recently. There's, of course, the famous you know anti-tax pledge, thou shalt never raise taxes. Reagan seems to have raised them about five times when, when his initial tax cut didn't uh, didn't raise as much revenue as he expected when when the deficit was too large. He he repeatedly pursued policies that raised taxes, mm -hmm. and then of course H. W. Bush raised taxes as well. And so I, I guess that's maybe to some extent that's a good sort of uh, measuring stick for for how things changed. What what do you think was was at the heart, or are there particular moments or or key elections figures who who brought the Republican Party to the post-Reagan model that that everyone sort of got used to over the past few decades of Republican is just anti-tax, anti-union, deregulate free trade. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ronald Reagan always said he was proud that he was, and I think still is, the only union president ever to sit inside the White House because he was twice, uh, two separate times, but multiple times reelected in his first stint president of the Screen Actors Guild. In fact, in his autobiography, he basically says, this is what prepared me for things like meeting with Gorbachev, that Gorbachev was nothing compared with Jack Warner. <laughs> uh, but it really changes during the Gingrich era, uh, is that what happens is uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, who himself was an eclectic figure and less conservative in practice, you know, conservative meaning soft libertarian in practice than he wanted you to believe, glommed onto this and you had activists who were pushing the no new taxes line. And George H.W. Bush had been um, ill-advised and maladroit at accommodating the old Reaganites into his administration. So they had their knives out for him. And Bush's tax rise was different than Reagan's tax raises. That Reagan raised business taxes and raising did other things, but he was steadfast against raising rates, even after you know after his tax. He was absolutely steadfast against that. And George H. W. Bush raised rates, so and he did so after saying in his acceptance address, "Read my lips, knows new taxes." In fact, the longer address, the longer part of that, uh, not inaugural address, acceptance speech at the Republican convention is even worse because he says they will push and I will say no, and they will push and I will say no, and they will push and I will say, read my lips, no new taxes. You know, and, and so it, it's kind of like if you were Lincoln and you were saying, read my lips, no secession, and then he turns around and says, well, I guess South Carolina can go. 
you know, you could see why people might be mad. Yeah. But it's really that era uh, that instigates that. And George H.W. Bush's loss is a huge factor that people on the right say this is because he raised taxes. And people uh, tended to fall in line with that. And it remained uh, a dogma in the Republican Party, it, arguably to this day, although one can look at polling support and say there's plenty of leeway within a Republican electorate to raise taxes if you raise them in the right way and on the right people. Well, and I think that that point about the electorate then is is exactly the the fascinating one, because, of course, we are seeing a realignment. We are seeing people move in and out of the parties. But it's not as if the Republican electorate in the 90s and 2000s was just country club Republicans. There, there simply are not enough. And so, you know, at the end of the day, a significant, probably the majority of the Republican base was was always the people who have now come to, to prefer a Donald Trump to a Nikki Haley. Um, what kept them in the coalition through this this long sort of more more market fundamentalist period? Was it was it simply that there was no alternative uh, or how how did it actually hold together so long? Yeah, well, it's not that people who are, you do not have a lot of statists in the Republican Party, to use the libertarian term. If you believe in actively expanding government as a matter of public policy, you are probably not in the Republican Party, even in the 90s and even today. The question is, do you believe in the active shrinking of government for its own sake? Or do you believe in private sector, private sector growth, free markets, but also a balance of subsidy and protection to make sure that everyone is benefiting from that. That's where the bulk of Republicans are. They don't want government to be the solution to all their problems, but they're not philosophically alien to limited, targeted, but effective government interventions, including taxes. You know, how many people have lost their seats because somebody raised gas taxes in the state? The answer is zero. Zero. Hmm. It's not a... And you take a look at the example of Kansas that I like to bring out is that you had a supply side tax cut pushed in 19, uh, not 1994, in the um, uh, 2006, I think it was, or 2010 by Sam Brownback. Um, And he says growth is going to come and they eliminate all income taxes on pass through corporations, you know, to which I've always wondered, you know, I think the Coke industries is in wichita and it's a privately held corporation did no lift no progressive ever pursued that what happened was the growth didn't come and in deep republican kansas what finally happened was moderates won primaries and they repealed the tax cut and he vetoed it and a two-thirds margin of both kansas houses overturned his veto so even kansans didn't prefer tax cuts to cutting the government programs that benefit them. And the Republican elite in Washington has willfully ignored all of this for years, even when presented with the facts. They choose to see ideology rather than the facts before them, which is something Ronald Reagan warned them against in a 1977 seat to CPAC, where he said, if you're a conservative, if you are somebody who believes in ideology over principles and will not adapt for facts, you are not a conservative. Right. And this this is what has perplexed me. And, and I, you know, this is where we most got to know each other, I think, is at, in, in the early Trump era, a lot of elected officials were suddenly trying to find <laughs> policy folks and, and political analysts who, who could maybe help them understand what on earth was going on and had something to say besides what Karl Rove might have been saying. Mm-hmm. And what I found so fascinating, you know, of course, the, the typical consultants would often be in these meetings as well. And, and you know, I remember from the, the Romney campaign that I was very involved in, in in 2012, being in the meetings with all the consultants, and it clearly was a very deeply, seemingly sincerely held view that you really did have to talk this way, that that talking about, you know, that privatizing Social Security was, was a great talking point that, uh, you know, shrinking government down and, and attacking it as, as the enemy was was a was a great thing to focus on that, you know, all, all of the makers versus takers and the et cetera, et cetera. 
partly obviously was infected by ideology, but but they really did seem to believe it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so fascinating about politics, of course, is that there is great accountability in, in the sense that either you win or you lose, and, and you should have very strong incentives to do the things that would cause you to win. Do you have any theory for why this entire industry seemed to sort of collectively decide to just do a bad job for so long? I think part of it is to see the $100 bill lying in front of you on the sidewalk. You actually need to be curious and look down. And it's very hard to get people to change their way of thinking, their paradigms, that they had thought a particular way for so long and that they thought they didn't need to re-examine their assumptions. Uh, I thought the Romney campaign was a perfect example of this. You know, I was on a platform with uh, Karl Rove in 2012, in March of 2012, and I was asked who was, he, yeah, we were asked who's going to win the election, and he, of course, said Romney, and I said Obama, and came around to me and to explain why, and I said, well, Romney's not going to do well with blue-collar voters, you know, is that he's not, doesn't understand their aspirations, and to which uh, Rove responded, well, they hate Obama so much, they'll vote for Romney anyway. Wrong. <laughs> now, my, yeah, the thing is that you can't get the answers unless you ask the questions and your paradigm prevent you from asking the questions. And then you get the thing is that it's very hard to be the first mover. You know, Ronald Reagan was an outsider who stormed, he didn't storm the Citadel the way Donald Trump did, but he was somebody who was not politically involved. He becomes politically involved in a serious way when he's 54 years old. So he's not beholden to anybody like that. All of these career people, if you're the person who's going to break with orthodoxy, you're the nail that's sticking up and the hammer is going to come down on you. And we all know that there are self-described and self-appointed um, enforcers who will make sure that the hammer comes down on you. So it's much, much safer to say the emperor has no clothes, even if you may be beginning to think, oh, maybe the emperor you say the emperor has clothes, even if you're beginning to think, well, maybe the emperor has no clothes. You're very afraid to say it. Yeah. I, and I guess that's, that is the perfect segue to Trump because, you know, the, the fascinating thing about Trump is, in my view anyway, that the 2016 GOP field was extraordinarily deep and talented mm -hmm. by most standards. I mean, Sure, maybe you, when you get down to number thirteen or fourteen, maybe not so much. But but that <laughs> the the first of the two debates on a given night with those first eight or ten candidates, you would have said this was a, a remarkably strong field. Oh yeah, and number yet, eleven was like Carly Fiorina, and she would have been not presidential mature, but she's an incredibly strong, articulate person. Yeah, no, that's right. And 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 they just they essentially are all out competing each other to be the exact same thing. Yeah, and. They all get wiped out. Yeah. And so as, as just a descriptive matter, they, Trump obviously accomplishes this. There are many different theories of like what it is about, right? Trump is different in so many ways. It's almost overdetermined to say why he succeeded. What do you think is most important? On, in, in which ways was Trump most importantly and, and successfully breaking with the orthodoxy? Pretty much every analysis of that election says it was a force of personality and a matter of he just got covered more. And it's exactly wrong. He was the only person with a message that resonated with a majority of Republicans. And what was the most important part? I don't think you can segregate it, is that the important part is there were parts of it, but it combined together in a unified whole. He said people are suffering. And he didn't say the answer is tearing down government. It was a government intervention. We need to stop competition from foreigners. We need to deal with trade, which means stop having foreigners undercut your wages. We need to stop immigration, you know, particularly illegal immigration, because we need to stop them undercutting wages at home. We need to stop undercutting your communities by cutting the entitlements that you rely on. He even floated raising taxes in the primary, although he's kind of kind of ran away from that. Um, but it, it was all under a action oriented, executive oriented, let's use the government to help people. And that resonated with millions of Republicans. And it resonated with millions of people who had never voted in Republican primaries before who came into the primary. And that's the thing that people, again, don't tend to note is that in 2016, 
the Republican turnout you always had trailed the Democratic turnout when there were two open elections like there were in 2016. It did in 2016, but it wasn't until California voted in the last week that the Democrats passed the Republicans. It was the closest margin ever. And that's because he attracted millions of people who hadn't heard things before that they wanted to. They wanted this. He brought the silent majority into the Republican Party and completely changed the calculus, while everybody else was basically giving variations on vanilla. You know, are we going to have Rocky Road? Are we going to have French vanilla? And he says, no, actually, I kind of like Tutti Frutti. Yeah, Rocky Rocky Road is is uh, there's a lot in the Rocky Road. I I will stand behind Rocky Road, but fair enough. We will we will come back to ice cream a bit later. Yes. Um. The what is what Trump has unleashed in a sense in in our politics now is this realignment mm -hmm. where he, I think what people recognized correctly was there was certainly a swath of traditional Republican voters who he was going to drive away. Mm -hmm. What they clearly did not appreciate was that he would bring in at least as many other voters. And in 2016, it's an interesting question how much he did. I, th I think he ultimately didn't actually do any better than Romney had done in, in, in net terms. But if we look sort of over the subsequent eight years to where we are today, it seems pretty clear he has at the end of the day, broaden the coalition. For for every libertarian you lose, there there may be several uh, working class voters, probably more socially conservative, but wanting to hear a different economic message, mm -hmm. um, increasingly of all different races, uh, who who now find this appealing. And I guess I wonder what do you see as as the as the end point of this? Does is this something that that potentially just keeps going that that the democrats then respond to where where does it go from here well you know the first thing to note is that uh what ronald reagan or not ronald reagan what donald trump first did was to turn from a economic a, a demographically declining minority spread across the country the romney ryan coalition to a demographically potentially increasing minority that is electorally efficient, which is why Donald Trump can win the Electoral College without winning the popular vote is because whites with a blue collar education dominate electoral vote heavy states in what used to be called the blue wall. And what is beginning to be clear it would have blown people's minds back in 2012 they thought the way to approach Hispanics was, we're going to say we're good on immigration, and then you're going to embrace our economics. It's exactly backwards. <laughs> and the reason They're why not, it's not passionate about the flat tax. Uh, gosh, no, no. You know, giving more money to Jeb Bush's friends so that they could theoretically invest in, in them, although, in fact, they invest in Malaysians or Indonesians, uh, did not appeal to Hispanics. But the idea of protecting them from competition, from people coming across the border illegally, maintaining the subsidies that they need and bringing jobs back that they can have is incredibly attractive to Hispanics. And so you have this thing that, this is not something that surprised me. I wrote about years ago that for cultural reasons, whites with a working class background were going to be the first adopters, but that they were going to be the you know, the tip of the spear, that what you were going to do was come behind them. You were going to find other races who had other concerns that would have to be ameliorated come in behind them. And it's, it's, this is exactly what's happening. And so what you've got is a Republican Party that is becoming more diverse against the very councils that the people who said they wanted diversity counsel. And that's because they had no idea who they were talking to absolutely no idea who they were talking to. And so now what you've got is this is part of a wave that is sweeping the world is that the people who have done well from globalization and from the spreading of progressive social norms over the last 25 years are finding that working class voters, middle class voters don't want what they're selling. They don't want the Green New Deal. They don't want to be told that their lives are, and their jobs are meaningless. They don't want to be told that their social norms are troglodyte and reactionary. They don't want it. And so the question is, 
One, how does the Republican Party respond? And what they've seen, we've seen is that the Republican Party uh, is largely responding in a way that says, we hear you and we represent you. And we'll have some more defections. You know, some of these people who are bemoaning J.D. Vance's nomination will become, you know, my view has been for well over a decade is that there's a lot more ground to be made up in the center is that if you get 7% in the center and you lose 1% to the Libertarian Party, that's a gain. You know, my, my advice to people who say, well, neo-Libertarians aren't welcome in the Republican Party anymore is say, darn straight, why don't you go to the party you want to be part of? Uh, you know, LP is kind of cool. They have better parties than we do. Uh, and um, more drugs. Uh, yeah, well, and cross-dressing star child uh, is, is a legend in the libertarian party and uh, was kicked out of Trump's speech. He was a man one day dressed up like a woman another day. It was, you know, you won't see that at the Republican convention. Um, so go join them. That's who you're comfortable with. Go join them. Um, and then you've got the question of how the Democrats can respond. And then you've got the Democratic problem, which is that the Democrats and the center left worldwide is being pushed by their populists. And their populists are saying, no, the problem with you guys is you're moving too slow. You're still too attached to neoliberalism. We want state planning. We want soft socialism. We want to continue to break down these social norms that we consider to be troglodyte. You guys are compromising too much. And the Biden administration has, I've said for a long time that Biden does have a political superpower. It's why he survived for 52 years. And that is his political superpower is identifying where the middle of the Democratic Party stands at any minute and occupying it. Problem is the dem middle of the Democratic Party, as is the middle of any center left political party, is now well to the left of the center of public opinion in virtually every Western democracy. And so you have the Democrats could respond, but to respond means to hold their left in thrall. And what we don't yet know is whether that's possible. Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer in Britain, won an election basically because the Tories imploded, but he did manage to hold the left in thrall because they wanted power so badly. Can he hold them in thrall for five years in government? Joe Biden won an election by holding the left in thrall enough that the center trusted him. And now we see what's happened and the center no longer trusts him. And this will be the first election since the New Deal where the Republican Party will have a voter plurality edge in voter identification in the exit poll in a presidential year. The UK example, I think, is, is really interesting and, and wanted to ask you about it because you, 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 you cover all of the, the, the French, the British, the um, sometimes very obscure countries at odd hours of the night. I, I see comprehensive breakdowns of, of the district by district results on your Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. uh, that, we'll is stick... <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, we'll we'll stick with the British for the moment. There's a fascinating way in which what's gone on in the UK is parallel to what's happened here. Obviously, Brexit was mm -hmm. the same summer as 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 Trump's election in 2016. Um, you had Boris Johnson, who's in some respects a Trumpian figure. And yet the position the Tories find themselves in today is in many respects the exact opposite of the position the, the Republican Party finds mm -hmm. itself in. My read of it is that if, you know, handing things back to Liz Truss uh, and, and Rishi Sunak was, was in effect as if the Republican Party, those in the Republican Party who had kind of wanted to go back to Paul Ryan and Nikki Haley had somehow triumphed. Yeah. Is, uh, is that the right analog? What, how do you make sense of oh, no, it is a, that is a wonderful so analog, except that, you know, Liz, Liz Truss, make, you know, Paul Ryan is a smart man and ideologically motivated, but he has some degree of practical politics. Liz Truss's essential argument after becoming PM and then being defenestrated is, I'm shocked to discover there's politics in this job. Um, but yeah, that's exactly. And what happened was the Tories got there first, the 2019 agenda. The 2019 manifesto basically was a wonderful blend of the old and the new. The problem was the Tory party didn't believe it. They did it for tactical purposes. And as soon as it became time to actually implement it, they ran away from it. They weren't going to open those hospitals. They weren't going to 
ta- tackle the housing crisis by telling their constituents, you actually have to stop the zoning that drives up housing around London so that you get appreciated prices, but people are priced out of the market. They're not going to lower taxes on lower middle income people. Uh, they didn't want the manifesto they ran on. And they didn't, they said they were going to cut in immigration. They raised immigration and they dawdle. It's because they didn't believe it. And so the party splits. Some centrists who voted for them because they didn't want Jeremy Corbyn and because they wanted some competent government went to labor, but basically, or the liberal Democrats, but basically what happened was conservatives who uh, and blue collar voters who wanted the 2019 manifesto voted for reform and the upper cut crust Tories stayed with the Tory party. And the result was the worst election in their 192 year history. That's it's interesting in the U S you know, you could say the same thing about Republicans to some extent, if you think about certainly during Trump's first term, you have Paul Ryan still pursuing tax cuts and Obamacare repeal. To this day, you have Mitch McConnell trying to do the Ukraine and immigration deal. There's certainly no shortage of folks who are not on board at all. Mm -hmm. And yet, is it just Trump is one of one? Or have other things gone better for for conservatives in the US that are, are worth highlighting as well? You know, I think part of what's happened in the U.S. uh, is that the Democratic Party remains what Keir Starmer did in Britain was basically say the problem we had was Jeremy Corbyn, that we went too far to the left. And because of that defeat, he had the credibility to drag the party back to the center. And that's the thing. He was able to plausibly say we are a changed party. The mantra that you heard more often than from anybody You kept listening to stuff and it was like they were robots. Keir Starmer has changed the Labour Party. You know, you hear this from people who know in their hearts that they're just waiting to come back. But that was the mantra. And the question is, can he do it in government? And will the left stand for it? You know, if you go through five years and there's no massive expansion of government and wokeness is shut down and more left wing people are uh, are, uh, tossed out of the party, as was the case in the last few years, now, will they stay in the Labour Party? We'll find out because that's what it's going to take to have credibility on the left. The Democrats haven't been willing to have that. So they're tainted by all of their loony left. Uh, and then you have the, for the United States. The distinct problem is that Keir Starmer is a man in his early 60s or late 50s. And Joe Biden is clearly a man who is in his declining phase. And the only question is where in the decline he is. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the other thing is that we've got a mass move. The Republican Party has primaries. The British Conservative Party does not. I would suspect that if you elected and selected leaders on the basis of mass voter primaries, as opposed to insider cabals, which is what they have there, that you would have seen a much more Farage tinged Conservative Party this time, because mm-hmm. that's where the voters are. But because that's not the way it is, the outsiders get shunted to the outside rather than being able to launch a hostile takeover. And what we've seen over the last eight years, it started with Trump. We've seen an ongoing hostile takeover of the Republican Party, primary after primary after primary. You have when it is basically old guard versus new guard, old guard versus populist, the populist wins. Now, they don't always win with the sort of populist economics that you and I are interested in, but they certainly don't win with the doctrinaire free market fundamentalism that characterizes the old guard. And when you have eight years of primary wins behind you at every level, the people who are the just backbenchers turn around and say, well, I am the people's leader and there they go. I must follow them. And that's what you don't yet have in the British. You may find it after parliamentary elections and council elections, which are be fought out, that people will begin to say, oh, wait a minute, there's more to this than they don't like Rishi and Liz and they do like Nigel. There's something. But uh, because of our party primaries, we've been having an ongoing referendum on New Guard versus Old Guard. And New Guard has been winning, 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 winning. And the Democrats in the U.S. now seem to have a problem also that if even if they go down to a fairly significant defeat, this time around, the the proximate cause will be Joe Biden. Right. Or if 
if he is in fact removed the ensuing mess and it seems quite likely you have at least one more cycle of believing that the, the that that those forces pushing further left and saying go faster are likely to still uh have the upper hand mm -hmm. in turn in creating probably a, a fairly significant opening for conservatives to secure and and build upon some some quite substantial gains which which brings us to to senator vance and and his elevation to the ticket um what do you make of it how how significant is it in 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 a party that is still just trump's party from top to bottom it is hugely significant it's hugely significant as is recognized by figures in the old guard because what it means is that trump has now placed his hands on somebody who more than anyone else in the Senate, well, maybe not more than, along with Marco Rubio and Josh Hawley and to an, another degree, Tom Cotton, has embraced the populist economics, that this is a guy who is willing to use government power to discipline corporations that are spreading woke ideology. This is a guy who's willing to raise taxes on corporations if they outsource jobs to other countries. This is a guy who is not wedded to free market fundamentalism in the least. This, uh, you know, I wrote a piece in the New York Post very praising of J.D., uh, whom I've known about as long as you have. Uh, and I think that one of the things that is refreshing about him is he has principles, but he doesn't have an ideology. He is not saying, OK, the world works this way and therefore A, B, C and D. Paul Ryan is a brilliant. I like Paul Ryan as a person and I respect him as a serious and publicly spirited man. But he is an ideologue. The world fits into a preset notion. J.D. does not have that. He has principles and a direction, but he does not have an ideology. And I think why Trump doing this, he's created a successor. J.D. is 39. He'll turn 40. Uh, Trump is elected. J.D. is vice president. He will run for the presidency as 43 or 44, which would make him roughly Obama's age. When Obama ran, he would be uh, uh, the one of the probably the second or third youngest president ever to win were he to win. And he will do so with a new message, having captured the party from the inside, but spreading it to voters who don't want the old guard message. And so I think it is hugely consequential. If the Trump fans ticket does lose, that will obviously be something that will redound to JD's, um, uh, not to his benefit, but to his detriment. Uh, but it'll be hard to say that they lost because of him, assuming that he doesn't commit massive blunders on the campaign trail. And so he'll just have to fight it out more. But you know, I think what we've seen is that the Republican primary electorate wants a conservative populist, somebody who is conservative without being offensively Christian, you know, which is to say you can be a strong, devout Christian, but what you can't do is basically say that that is an entrance requirement to come into the Republican Party, which we know some people implicitly do. Uh, you can be somebody who talks about populist economics, private sector growth, and government intervention. They go hand in hand in a healthy society. He can make that case. Uh, and he can talk about, uh, you know, I think that he would be a restrained internationalist. I don't think he's an isolationist, but he is not somebody who thinks that every war is ours and every war can be won if only we applied our military might. I think you would find that he would be a very strong challenger, even if he is not the sitting vice president. It is hugely, hugely consequential. And so what does it mean for the old guard then? I mean, I think up, up until the up until the minute that that the news broke that of the nomination, you could imagine a world in which Trump picks Glenn Youngkin and we're headed into a 2028 knockdown drag out primary between the the Vances and Rubio of the world and and the, the Youngkins and Burghams and so forth. Right. Um, to your point there, the the playing field is now tilted very differently. The old guard is not going to go quietly into the night. They still, at least in terms of financial resources, are extraordinarily influential within the party. Yes. Um, 
what if anything do you what, what is their move what 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 would you expect do you expect them to get with the program what what would you advise them to do if if they want to remain relevant or 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 should they stick to their guns and and they still have a chance next time around too they have no chance this is the thing is that old guard 1980s non rethought free market fundamentalism is dead as a politically successful movement it cannot win an election um yeah i say that events could conspire so that four years from now this will sound like an incredibly stupid thing to say and four years from now i might change my mind but the fact is the data has been showing for well over 15 years that this is the correct analysis is that globalization created its own challenges the advocates of globalization have refused to see them and in fact have remained steadfast in their denial that they exist and as a consequence they are not able to respond to voter demand uh, that and what i would advise them to do is the sort of thing i've been trying to advise people to do for 15 years which is adapt or die you know which is there is legitimate challenges to the nine, you know 2006 era economic framework people weren't all benefiting a rising tide wasn't lifting all boats there were people at whose livelihoods was being crushed people who were not getting help who were being ignored and disregarded and their communities were falling into uh, disarray and to this day i don't think many of the old guards see that you know, they, or they say well you know the solution is just cut taxes more and we'll be able to invest. you never invested in those areas you never invested in those people why should we think that giving you more money will do it particularly if trade is open, you'll just go invest more money in the, you'll just go invest more money in foreign countries because they have cheaper labor, weaker environmental standards, and you can make the money by selling back here. Why should we trust you? Um, so I don't think they can adapt because again, we've, they have been staring at this in the face for eight and eight years with Trump. The facts of the world have been staring them in the face for 14 years since 2010, nearly 16 since 2008. They've refused to adapt in any meaningfully way. So why do I think that they can adapt now? And what that means is that they'll run the same old, same old, and that they'll try and put on some clothes and say, well, I'll fight illegal immigration and I'll fight your culture war, but they can't go all the way because to fight those things means to embrace a degree of government power that they simply are unwilling and unable to do, you know, which is one of the things that Nikki Haley ran into is that, you know, she wants to be a conservative culture warrior, but she criticizes DeSantis for doing what he did with Disney. That doesn't cut it with the person who cares about these issues. They want the use of government power to stop people using their private power to spread what they consider to be noxious nostrums that actually have economic effects, depriving people who disagree with this new orthodoxy opportunity to have jobs and a good remunerative career. So I just don't think they can adapt. And I think what that means is that if it would be Yunkin versus Vance, Vance would win. It would surprise people by how easily he'd win. That's certainly my assessment as well. I think, you know, to your point, it's not just they they haven't adapted on on the sort of need for for government to to play a role they're still out there just releasing papers saying how great everything is like there right. there is not even a, a willingness to acknowledge the the problem to begin with and w what i'm i guess most morbidly curious about is that i think you're right there there are some organizations that are adapting the heritage foundation i think is an an example of of one that has Made made very productive strides under Kevin Roberts's leadership, mm -hmm. but then you have these organizations out there like like an AEI or a Cato Institute, and you know I we we both have friends at at these places. I I think they do high quality work, mm -hmm. but to your point, it's it, it's not correct, and it's it is decreasingly relevant, and yet they have they have the resources to continue putting out those papers in, in into the void for for decades i'm i'm almost sort of morbidly curious to to see what happens now maybe at some point that it it becomes so uninteresting to keep doing that work that that people choose not to but it, it is funny to hear the phrase sort of zombie reaganism and think that that there is going to be almost literally a sort of zombie 
old right that 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 may go on for some time but is just not no longer connected really to to what is happening in american politics right and what i think is going to happen you know let's say trump does win and you know things can change but right now you'd have to say i would say he's a 60 percent chance there's some models that have him over 70 percent chance of winning um you know and then jd is the vice president um if jd w- runs for president which he would he would be challenged and he'd probably be challenged from somebody from the old guard uh maybe somebody who says he's not maga enough there's always you know like when ronald reagan ran in 1980 they had people running at him from the right saying he's ronald reagan isn't good enough well from a hardcore libertarian perspective that they were right and they got two percent of the vote and dropped out um what hasn't happened yet is an unambiguous win for populist economics what you call conservative economics as opposed to libertarian economics that doesn't involve donald trump is that most of the people who win republican primaries adapt some of those themes or are open to some of those things but they don't win on that ground you know even jd when he ran talked about that a lot but there wasn't the center point of his campaign and, the 20- and to your point he he ultimately relied heavily on donald trump's endorsement to yeah. to come through that's right and so people could have seen jd's victory as oh well here's the populist economics and so instead what they said here's another trumpian um and here's another angry culture warrior blah 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 a 2028 primary would be fought on this ground a victory by jd would be like ronald reagan defeating the left of the republican party decisively in 1980. it took a while for the left of the Republican Party to fade away. You know, you still had people all the way into as late as 2001 who were essentially liberals. James Jefford of Vermont was the last senator who was a 100% liberal who still declared himself as a Republican. But their end was clear that there was no market for this anymore. And what happened was they left and became Democrats and conservative Democrats came in and became Republicans. So that's when New England became Democratic and the South and the Midwest became much more Republican. Um, You know, Ronald Reagan, you say that's, you know, the government program is the nearest thing to eternal life on this earth. Um, Actually, the truth is a nonprofit with its own endowment is the nearest thing to eternal life on this earth. They're not, you know, if they were a business, their massive cash reserves would mean that they would get bought up by private equity and split it up. Uh, So, you know, you can keep as long as you've got an endowment, you can just keep talking and talking, but nobody will be listening. And politicians are good at a lot of things. And one of the things they are best at is figuring out where the winds blow after somebody is a market leader. If somebody goes ahead of them and shows where the winds are blowing, they will move quickly to adapt to that. You see a win in 2028 that says in the Republican Party, old guard beats, loses to new guard, that populist conservative economics beats free market fundamentalism. You'll be amazed at how many people were conservative populists all along. We just didn't know it. Well, miles to go before we sleep, but we will have to leave it there. Henry Olson, you can find Henry's work at at the New York Post, on Twitter, at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, on the Commons at American Compass. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. And we will be back soon with another episode of the American Compass podcast.